I do have to pee. Making life worth living and retirement worth having is literally about helping people to go further in life. You see, it's never about us in someone's life. It's always their life. It's their responsibility to produce a life is true. But if we are monsters in people's lives, we are interfering with their right to pursue life, liberty, happiness, and all the tenets of the U.S. Constitution. You see, in life, there are laws that give us rights. There are a few laws that take our rights away, but for the most part, what is said, what is sold to us as born Americans, or those literally who come here for the land of milk and honey and plenty, is that there are opportunities here. That there are literally opportunities for us to make a wage that's fair, to provide for us room, board, and shelter, to have food literally on the table that is not tainted, that is not interfered with, to have clean, reasonably clean toilets, facilities, and to not be impeded by militant police officers that sort of go on in third world countries around the world. That's why they're called third world, not to play a pun on words. But openly, that is the human rights bill. And I'm probably saying the document completely wrong. I've tried to literally figure out what it's officially called, but it's been sort of a struggle as I've looked at different websites to get it clearly in my mind what the actual language is. You see, the U.S. Constitution is just that, the Constitution. The amendments are just that, the amendments. The Bill of Rights is that, the Bill of Rights. But this human rights is usually term talked about in terms of a campaign, literally. There are many people, including one of my siblings, who produces events trying to free and liberate women who are literally taken for the wrong reasons. Their entire life is changed by the fact that some man decided that they were property to them, that they literally could go and do things and say things and be things to that individual without that person's, man or woman's, opportunity to say no. So it's sort of odd to me that people continue to make emotional tirades over little rights in the land. You see, we all have the little right to have a clean toilet. We all have the little right to have clean water. We try, at least, in most countries that have technological advancements to produce clean water for our people so that we don't get ill and get malaria and all the things that other countries, like in Africa, South America, are struggling with. We have to really protect that resource. I have always been amazed for the past 20-some years of literally living in a affluent community that we have a well that literally has no protection to it. I am beyond somewhat concerned about this. Literally, that there are people who drop junk in that well. Sure, some debris can blow in from the road, but it's pretty well covered and connect and protected by the land, by the trees, etc. But And there might be someone who's in charge of parks and recs who literally cleans it up. But I'm beyond offended that children and adults would leave it somewhat filthy. I literally had a blister the other day and took my feet off, or my feet off, took my socks off, sorry, literally to go and just wash up because a little bit of grime had gotten in my shoe and I'm not wearing a lot of socks these days just because of the heat. But there was no clean space to walk. There was literally muddy water on the outside of the well because people had not taken care of that precious resource. They hadn't realized that a flowing well is a flowing well, which probably repumps and comes back. But once it's gone, it's gone. Now, Waterworld was not the most incredible film by, you know, uh, Kevin Costner, but it did sort of talk about how to handle situations when there's no water and no clean water. As a nation, we really need to get to outdoor facilities and buy more information about how do we make sure the water we're drinking, even if we're out in the countryside, is literally clean. We need PSA announcements on how to do that, how to protect our resources, how to make sure people are not polluting them. People from foreign countries that think that they can do anything they think and feel like here. We already have that problem that walk across the border, and not all of them are doing that, but a large percentage of, of them are. My point literally is that when we're trying to make a life worth living and retirement worth having, it's the people in our lives that raise us up 
to higher ground. There are also people in our lives, typically family members, that bully us, that drive us crazy in their thought processes, and literally drag us down. I know a great deal about this because in the last few years of my life, I've had total attack from family members in this regard, and they're livid about the fact that I tell about this honestly. It is 100% provenly factual, yet I've got a mother that calls it slander. It's not slander if I have the documents in front of me proving they're doing this. And practically, it's put me at bay in ways that I do not like. It's put me on lists that have violated my rights hundreds of times now during the last three years. And it puts me at risk from the people who've stolen things out of my pants while I slept in a car that was locked. People have broken my computer while it was sitting on a seat in a locked car next to me in the night because I had not produced enough income to produce myself a residence or a hotel. And I'm not really sure what people are thinking about these days. You see, I met a woman today who was very kind doing her job, telling me that her boss told me to basically go elsewhere and wouldn't provide me a liaison or a contact information like a normal person who's doing business networking and business development to have. But she literally understood when I said, look, homelessness is not something that is downtown only. Most people are one or two paychecks away from homelessness. She totally felt that statement. She shook her head upside, right up, you know, up and down, literally saying, and raised her hand, like me, I'm almost homeless. I'm struggling in life. And she says, I totally feel what you're saying. I totally understand what you're trying to accomplish here. I totally get you're trying to produce a sponsor that has the right name for this idea that you've got brewing in your mind. But I am in that subcategory. I am not a manager. I'm a receptionist. And as much as I want to help you, I don't have the power or authority to give you that help. Neither is this the right department for it. But that man missed a marketing moment in time for that company. He could have literally said, that's an intriguing idea. I don't have the right to make a decision on it, literally, but I'll just do a little bit of checking in our company directory to find you the right person who makes those decisions to allow you the opportunity to sell that idea to them. It's not my decision to say that they won't make that decision. And that's literally what happened in the previous audio cast that I talked about where the pastor literally refused to purchase a book to put in a library to allow the people of his congregation to literally decide whether or not, A, they liked the book, B, they had any inspiration coming from the Bible verses shared in that book and in that work of that homeless man, or whether or not they heard something from the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of the world that inspired them to do something in their own life. You see, when people are reading stuff, they, we often ask the question, is this for me, Lord? Is this something I do? Is this something I need to work on in my life to improve my soul, to raise my vibration, to increase my spirit and my impact on other people in the world? Because let's face it, it's the people of the world that might make life worth living. Now, when you say things like that, the people in the mental health facility immediately want to go, oh, you're not feeling good, you're depressed, you're... Good. No, it's the absolute truth that the people in our lives, once lost, impact us. When they're around, they impact us. When my father died, I was devastated. But I've told the story about how I was literally in the shoe department of a facility that was employing me at that moment in time as I was putting my life back together after major attacks from people I loved and cared and trusted, and they betrayed me completely. And literally, my father, I made a prayer that said, if it's time, Lord, for my father to go so that my mother has a little bit of peace of mind and that literally my dad's been hanging on in a coma, not eating, not responsive, nothing. If it's time for him to pass into light to meet the heavenly father and mother in heaven, then let him go. Let him know I love him and I'm okay. He doesn't have to wait for me to come. I'll be there shortly, but he doesn't have to wait. He knows I love me. I love him. And in that moment of time of that prayer that I released to the heavens, my sister called and said my father crossed over. Now I get a warm, fuzzy, a tingling feeling when I share that story right now in this moment, literally this light giving moment of time that practically we can either manipulate people and shout at them and lie to them and lie to ourselves 
about the harm that they think, feel that we're going to give them. That is a mental problem. That is an emotional problem. That is not Lord God's statement on truth. Now, I talk about God freely. I'm a man who's homeless. I've lost everything important in life. I've lost the people I love dearly. I've lost the woman that I would die for. I've lost children I could have impacted positively. I've lost touch with my son who's in Japan. My son. I can proudly say my son because I raised him from a period of time when his father literally beat the hell out of his mother to the point that she left him for something a little bit better. To the practical time of adulthood when he made the choice, despite my wanting to say, don't go, to go home and meet his father again for the first time in a long time. I didn't want to go and I missed my opportunity to say when he asked me, you don't want me to go, do you? And I literally should have said, no, I don't want you to go. I think it's the worst idea in the world. But I also knew he had a craving to see his biological father. So I literally said, no, I don't want you to go, but I think it would be good for you because you need to know that life a little bit. That was a major mistake on my part. If he hears this audio file, please know, my son, my Japanese boy, that I miss you a lot despite the tough love we had to do to help you grow into a man. Your mom says you've turned out just fine, and I'm so proud to hear that, even though I had very little to do with it, I'm sure, as so many people would like to say. But maybe, according to her also, a little bit of me has rubbed off on him. He's parenting children that are not of his own loins, just like I did. He's loving kids as a dad, just like I did. He's hopefully taking care of his girl, just as I did. But that's private information. That's a man talking about the life. It's the people in our life, the people that we love, the people that we're proud to know, the people that we say are trustworthy and honest and true, despite the difficulties we have with them, that we love, that we honor, that we cherish, that we don't go about attacking with litigation abuse, emotional abuse, financial abuse, and all the other types of physical and mental, psychological warfare that comes from the devil. And I'll just be a pastor in this moment. You see, anything that makes a negative statement about another person is not of Lord God. Now, facts about what someone is doing and what their behavior is producing is not the same as negative rhetoric, negative press. We used to call it mudraking campaigns when we learned in, jur in journalism. The politicians do this all the time today. It makes me ill. It makes a lot of people ill. Nobody wants you to explain what the other person is saying and doing. We can do that on our own. We can look, we can read, we can figure that out by ourselves. Focus on what you are doing, what you're capable of doing, what you feel the country needs, the position is going to allow you to provide for people. Don't tell me negative crap about someone else. Now, we can say that because these people are strangers literally to us, but when it hits closer to home, when it happens amongst our colleagues, when it happens amongst our professional network, when it happens amongst people that we've told know, like, and trust us, or with family members who are totally off their rocker on something that is not their right to do, we literally have to step back and say, is God in this situation? And if he or she is, what is he telling us completely about Loving someone right now. Peacemaking right now. You see, matter of fact talk is rebuke. It is literally something in the Bible. That when someone is lying to themselves about what someone is thinking or feeling, in other words, a different person than themselves, you see, we don't literally know the insides of a person, which is absolutely true. But how a person approaches an individual is how they're responded to. If someone is responded to with love, care, and kindness, then they get love, care, and kindness back. If someone literally is being attacking, slandering, meaning they're lying about what is going on in a person's life, that is difficult for a person to maneuver and they will distance themselves completely. Now here's where the Bible talks about something important. It literally says, if there's a discord, go to that person in love and work it out in peace. And if that doesn't produce peace by your attempt to do that, then take someone else or talk to someone else who's an authority in their life and see if you can produce peace. 
I literally did that with someone. I literally tried off and on for almost three plus years. I still sometimes reach out because I love that person's soul. No matter how much harm I have felt from that individual, I love her soul. I literally did try and talk to an authority figure in her life, and he actually made it worse. He didn't produce any peace at all. He never called me. He never involved himself in getting to know me at all. But he told her all sorts of lies about my life. He rendered an opinion about me instead of seeking God first to say, Lord, what should I do to help this man and this woman come together in love, peace, honor, and extend grace to one another? And that happens in life. People choose warfare over loving care. You see, in Magic and Mayhem, I'm going to tell stories, literally, of how God prepared me for a moment in time and then what happened in that exact moment in time that happened after that insight I received in my heart and soul and mind about what was coming. I have hundreds of stories now like this where I simply have chosen to live my life submitted to the Lord in heaven. It's not easy. It's a load, low, road less traveled, as one of the world's famous authors says, I suppose. It's his language. Maybe I'm using it in the wrong way and out of context of how he has, but it is some language that everybody has probably heard in their life. Off the beaten trail, off the beaten path, on a different approach to life. And I've experienced more magic in the world from those moments of just being literally humbled by what God has allowed me to be safeguarded from. At the same time, the mayhem ensues because people are involved. And people don't stop and go, if I was Jesus standing right now in this moment, how would Jesus respond? Would he attack? Would he blast someone? Would he destroy? Would he rebuke? Now, rebuke is something we do in love. That's what the Bible says. That sometimes people need to be rebuked so that they can see the error of their ways. But it's really about whether or not that person who's doing the rebuking has the actual access to do so. In my life, I've had a few stories of people trying to rebuke me who really didn't have that trust with me. And the entire situation blew up because they literally didn't earn that opportunity. You see, in business networking, in relationship development, in social networking, online or offline or 3D or whatever we call it, it's moments of time that make all the difference in the world. I often say a sale is made in minutes and lost in seconds. You see, literally when we take the focus off the other person, what they need, hope for, and long to accomplish, when we put it on our own feelings and our own interpretations of what's going on for that person's life, we literally lose our rights to their life. When we lie, when we manipulate, when we overstep our boundaries, when we go into their lives and do destructive things that literally gets them harmed or harms them directly, we have lost the rights to their life. Now, giving someone a gift is not meant to harm them. Yes, we've all heard the stories and seen the movie on TV about stalkers, but usually those gifts are warped sort of things. And the person's showing up in their life all the time on a regular basis. But when it comes to someone trying to repair a relationship, gifts are appropriate in many nations' cultures. But at the same time, the individual is not literally showing up at their doorstep, doesn't even probably know where the person lives, doesn't literally have their telephone number coming, but they're reaching out every so often to old connections, to old contacts, to say, hey, I just want you to know I'm still thinking about you. I still love you. I still miss your soul in my life. There's a huge difference in those things. And usually what happens in these moments of time is one person lies and says the person is doing something ill-willed and the other person insists, no, I'm not, and here's the proof as to why. Now, in your life, who do you need to love more? Who do you need to set aside your emotions and your interpretations that are negative of an individual's personality or communication style or how they conduct themselves over the telephone to say, I am not going to respond in a way that's unloving. I'm going to look at my life 
my time in terms of my time to do things for myself versus the time that I should be giving in philanthropic work. And then I'm going to decide, is doing philanthropic work important right now to people that I don't know at all? Or is doing something loving and kind more important to someone that is literally a blood relative, a close friend, or a recent social acquaintance? You see, that is the layer where we lose our faith when we don't realize our responsibility and liability for the things and actions we take in people's lives. That when we literally do something on paper or that creates a legal mark on someone's life, we have created a destructive force. Not always. If it's a recommendation, that's one thing. But if it's a negative comment, if it's a lie about their mental state because you're actually not in their life, that is something offensive to God. You see, the number one commandment is Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Do not lord over people. I am the Lord of the land. Now, not everyone's going to get this message, but I'm going to say it succinctly and clearly. Love is the only answer to rebuke. You see, most people respond to rebuke with anger, outrage, hanging up, all sorts of temper tantrum, baby-like responses. Did Jesus ever do any of those things? Never. Why? Because he was perfect, of course. But openly, he is the model for which we are supposed to engage in the rest of the people, human world. And that model says, love your neighbor above yourself. Loving your neighbor above yourself means letting them lead their own lives where they need to go, allowing them the dignity and responsibility for that, but not doing anything that interferes with their lawful rights in this land in terms of their legal name, their physical being, or any other aspect of what makes them a human being in a major first-class country as opposed to a third-world nation. Now, this has been Blake Enson of Blaze Communications, LLC, talking about magic and mayhem. Magic comes from God when we receive the blessings that he sets aside for us because we submitted totally to him. That can be in all sorts of situations and relationships. The mayhem ensues when the people that we seek help from literally decide to destroy what we're trying to accomplish by putting barriers and interference in our paths. Unnecessary completely most of the time. You see, in life we have moments in time to make a difference. We have to take back talk, the anger, the outrage, anything we might feel. But if it's our life, we have the right to be passionate. We have the right to be livid. We have the right to feel rage for someone who's violating our rights. In life, we have moments of time to make a difference for someone. We can either work to destroy them with lies and manipulations, which we will be accountable for to God for, or we can raise them up for all their greatest gifts and help them to achieve more in life than they could ever do on their own. Again, this has been Blake Ensign of Blaze Communications, LLC, saying thanks for listening.